Hi folks, so uh, what we have here today is a uh, Sergeant 4820 series auxiliary deadbolt. Uh, this is a mortise double cylinder deadbolt and the kind of the unusual thing about it is the fact that it is just a deadbolt. It's not uh, the full size mortise cassette with the uh, latch for a, a handle. Uh, this would be included in addition to one of those or in addition to a uh, cylindrical knob. Um, these are kind of unusual just because you don't have a lot of call for a a mortise deadbolt that is just a deadbolt. Uh, generally, if you're going to go through the expense and uh, difficulty of installing a mortise lock uh, relative to or compared to uh, the the amount of work required to install a cylindrical bore or rim uh, lock set. Uh, mortise is a lot more time consuming, a lot more work, requires specialized tools, very easy to screw up, and then you've just wasted a thousand dollar door. Um, but uh, this actually came out of a uh, hospital <clears throat> in my area. Uh, they had a whole bunch of these at one point. And so likely this was used to uh, secure some particular area and it happened to meet their particular needs there. Um, but uh, Sergeant, Sergeant no longer makes these because this is a, a cast iron body. Uh, pretty much all the major manufacturers at this point have stopped making cast iron bodied locks and they've gone to uh, stamped steel or uh, cast aluminum or Zamac or zinc, uh, which doesn't really have the, most of those don't really have the strength, although the, the, <clears throat> the, uh, stamped steel, uh, are pretty good. Um, anyway, uh, this is a double cylinder version. Um, we've got it fitted with, uh, two Sergeant 40 series cylinders, Nothing super special about them. They're just one eighth inch. This is the uh, number forty one, which is the one eighth inch. It's got a nice uh, brushed chrome finish, which matches the trim plate here. And if we get the keys out. It's a pretty decent bidding there. And just to show that the lock does in fact work. So we've got that uh, with the bolt out, so it's locked, uh, and you know, let's get to the picking so I can open this stuff up and show them to you. Like I said, nothing really special about these cylinders. They're uh, six pin, pretty much all standard stuff, but they are sergeant pins, which I don't think I've shown you before, and there are some interesting things with sergeant pins. So uh, let's get started. Uh, we're using the thinner Peterson pry bar and uh, I'm going to use the thinner uh, Peterson hook uh, just because, well, this because this is the uh, Sergeant LA keyway which is kind of their stock keyway and uh, this, I just happen to find this pick a bit more comfortable. So I'm going to go in here trying to keep my hand out of the way of the lens and I think that's number three it feels like it's binding so keep feeling around it's very easy to get hung up on the warding in the LA keyway it's got a lot of fine grooves in this very sharp turn uh, about halfway up So, yeah, I don't think we quite set pin three, so let's try again. All right, hopefully we did that without oversetting it. Two. Three, still stiff. Four, no. Five, no. Six. 
I gotta say, this thing is really camera shy. Set. Okay. Gotta click out of three. And move on. Back to three, so probably didn't set that. Another click out of three. Keep feeling around. Still landing on three. Four, probably, yeah, five, six, back to one, nothing. Two gave us something, three, no, no. Six. All right, one more try, and then we'll abandon this attempt. Start again. Okay, we're on number four now, I think. I think. I think that's six that we're on. It's pretty stiff and good click out of him. Uh, now we're on number two, I think. Good click out of two. There we go. Three, good click. Four, very stiff. Good click, and one, and we've got it, didn't lose it, thankfully, but there's no actual spring pressure on the cylinder, and now let's try turn that. We get about halfway around, and we see that uh, the bolt isn't moving, and that's because we're actually turning in the wrong direction. So I'm going to show you another little trick. Uh, it's really generally only used in the field. Uh, if you're just, just doing lock sport competition, doesn't really matter because you're not usually dealing with an actual bolt. But this is a plug spinner. I may have shown you my Peterson plug spinner uh, before. Uh, this is a right hand spinner which uh, a rubber band uh, gave me a while ago, uh, and I've really grown to like it. So, what we're going to do uh, basically, this is going to allow us to snap this back past the locked position uh, so that we can then turn it the other way. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to wind it by turning the tip in the direction that the lock is turned, because that way the spring pressure will cause it to snap back in the direction that we actually want to go. We're going to put the tip here into the keyway as close to the center of the plug as possible. Hold the body of the plug spinner nice and tight and stiff, and we're going to press the release. And you see how that just snapped it over. So now we're still unlocked, didn't lose that open. And now we can retract the bolt. Uh, now, in order to get this thing out, we are going to want to get it to more or less back to the lock position. And now we get out the screwdriver. Uh, so, to start, if this was installed in a door, uh, we'd have a much harder time with this. But what we're going to do is, pretending uh, that it's in a door, we're going to take off two screws that are holding the trim plate on. Uh, 
Uh, and now, since this isn't actually in your door, we can just lift that off. Uh, often, if it's installed uh, nicely in a door, uh, this will be pretty much flush with the wood. It'll be very tight, so you might take a small screwdriver and poke around in there until it lifts off. It's just a nice uh, stainless steel plate with a chrome finish on it, a chrome plating. And now uh, we can see the two wood screws that would hold this into the door. We can remove those. And the two set screws that are holding the cylinders in place. Uh, so now we're going to take those out. Quick, just go in there with a big flathead screwdriver. It's recessed a little bit. Just undo it until the head of the screw is roughly flush with the side plate here. And hopefully you can see, maybe over here, you can just make out the tip of that screw and the channel in the side of the cylinder that that fits into to hold it in place. Actually, I don't need to remove him. I don't know why I started to do that. Habit, I guess. So actually, we're going to want this guy to stay in there so that we can demonstrate some things once we get this open. But it's, so this is the guy that we actually managed to pick. So that's the one that I'll show you. So there we go. Uh, this cam is uh, kind of known as the offset sergeant cam, just because that's uh, a shape pretty much specific to sergeant. And we'll just set him over there. And let's keep going with the deadbolt itself. Uh, if we look at the sides, we can see that this is just a thin, well, relatively thin faceplate that's still like close to an eighth of an inch at points. So we're just going to remove this one big Phillips screw that's holding it in in the middle. It's a nice long one. And now that that screw is out, the faceplate kind of just lifts off, but this uh, set screw sticks through the side plate. So we're going to need to angle it, let the tail drag a little bit as we pull it out, and that lifts off. So they're very simple. That's the hole for the screw, uh, for the screw that holds the cover plate on. There is the ring that the mortise cylinder screws into, and then these tabs are pretty much here just to uh, keep the plate aligned. So we can set that to the side, and now we can see the inner workings of this lock. So this is pretty much all of the moving parts in this deadbolt. Uh, the bolt itself, the uh, lever, and this spring here are pretty much the only components aside from the the case and the uh, various screws that hold everything together. So we're going to put those keys. There we go. Uh, when you have the keys, if you try to turn this the wrong way, that tailpiece just butts up against the side of the deadbolt there. If we turn it correct, uh, the correct way. What this does is it pushes down on that lever and pushes the bolt outwards and then just as you get to the end the tip of that tailpiece will push on that sloped surface and allow the lever to come back up and there's this post here that's actually mold, uh, cast into the body and now this lever as you can see is going to block the deadbolt from being pushed in. And that's what makes it a deadbolt. If this uh, surface was sloped so that you could push it back out, 
or push it back in, it wouldn't be a deadbolt. It would just be a bolt. Uh, but now let's, so just pushing that lever down and then the deadbolt is able to slide in and out. So now that we've done that, let's push that in and lift that bolt out. So there you can see, again, very simple, just cast. It has this uh, post that fits into this slot on the bolt to guide it, uh, help keep it level. And then this uh, post here for this uh, lever to lock into, lock against. Uh, the bolt itself, uh, while it is very nice and shiny there, it is not actually steel. This is a magnet uh, screw retriever. Uh, this is probably uh, cast brass with uh, chrome plating, but the spring and the lever are both steel. And that's really the whole thing. Very, very simple. If we push in on this, we can actually slide. If we push in on the spring, compress it, we can actually remove the lever and spring. Spring itself is very, very simple. It's just this C-shaped strip of spring steel uh, that's set into this notch. And then this is the entire is the bolt itself. Uh, it's nice thick head here uh, is mostly there. Most of that thickness is there to stop you from trying to saw through it very easily. Uh, it does, obviously the thickness also plays a role in uh, keeping, uh, resisting that force if you try to just kick the door, or push in on it, uh, but that still a little bit of a weak point there, so all of this is actually this, ex which is why this extends pretty deeply into the case and faceplate there. So let's just yeah, drop that. Uh, now, like I said before, I think uh, Sargent no longer makes the 4820 series or any uh, cast iron uh, bodied locks. Uh, they have replaced them uh, largely with uh, stamped steel, which is fine. Nothing wrong with stamped steel. Lots of good things are made from stamped steel. And stamped steel is still very nice and strong. Uh, a lot of other companies, if they do still make a product like this, uh, have probably transitioned over to uh, Zamac, uh, which is very popular for making uh, components where you don't necessarily need a ton of uh, uh, torsion resistance, but you do need a certain amount of compression resistance. I still like uh, cast iron, though. Anyway, now that we've done that, Let's get that out of the way, get our pinning tray here, and get the camera aimed, and let's open this cylinder up. So we've got two flathead screws holding the cam on. Get those started. Cam off. Uh, now we're going to need those keys again for a second. And we've got our follower here. There we go. Uh, now, luckily, Sargent uses uh, generally what is roughly a, a half inch diameter plug, so you can use uh, the same. 
uh, followers you use for most other popular uh, lock brands. And let's see what we've got in here. Very long standard, a shorter standard, standard, standard. And another standard. Uh, since this is factory direct, no countermilling, just a little bit of wear, but a very nice uh, chrome plating job there. And let's get the tweezers out and give you a closer look at one of these pins. This is Sargent's standard key pin, and you can see how it's a bit different from most of the other ones that you may have seen. So. The top here is very flat, very, very slight beveling at the edges. That's just to give it a little bit of tolerance for imperfections and depths. And the tip is this sort of shallow dome, uh, which is also part of why uh, the cuts on a sergeant key are a little bit uh, unusual. There we go. Okay, and this is what, pin 5. So you can see how it actually sits pretty evenly and fills up most of that uh, gap. But the thing is, you might not be able to see it very clearly, but uh, Sargent actually uses a compound curve instead of a uh, perfectly even slope in their locks, or if you're cutting to factory specifications. Uh, so it actually changes by a couple of degrees, just a fraction of an inch above the flat of the cut, uh, which combined with this sort of round-nosed uh, pin actually allows you to get away with uh, some pretty severe max violations. But fun stuff. And there we go. Now let's take a look at what's up top. Very carefully, I'm going to pull the follower out. And there is a standard top pin and rather long but somewhat weak spring. Another standard pin, but notice how much longer it is than the first one. Uh, that's because Sargent uses balanced pin stacks. That is, uh, the overall height of the pin stack is going to be more or less consistent throughout the lock. So where you have a longer key pin, you're going to have a shorter driver pin, and where you have a short uh, key pin, you're going to have a much longer driver pin. If uh, whoever put the lock together is following Sargent's pinning rules. Last one. Oof, very long. And nothing but a bit of wear inside the cylinder there. So there you have it. Just some uh, interesting little stuff. Uh, you don't generally see Sargent as a residential lock uh, these days. Uh, they have pretty much uh, entirely chased the commercial and institutional market, which is where you'll see them 
and it's why uh, most of their keys are all these uh, much chunkier nickel silver ones and why they are pretty much all six or seven pins these days. Anyway, uh, until next time, uh, thank you for watching and happy picking.